There we go. Now we have to all behave. <laughs> clean it up. Clean it up. That's right. Well, it's a couple minutes after the hour, so why don't we go ahead and get started? I'm sure people will uh, yeah. be drifting in as people are want to do on these calls. So yeah. um, welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. We're really excited to be able to do um, this webinar highlighting, highlighting the experiences of long-term non-progressors and kind of the uh, the queen of long-term non-progressors, uh, Lorraine mm -hmm. uh, Willenberg, who is um, known in the press and to the world as the so-called San Francisco patient, uh, the first um, known person to have naturally cured her HIV. Um, mm -hmm. And Lorraine can tell us more about her story and kind of how she got to that place. But it's <laughs> really kind of remarkable and gives hope to those of us who follow cure research that perhaps we can take that secret sauce that Lorraine seems to have and... Uh, <laughs> and uh, make that available to everyone. And, and Dr. Stephen McGillis will be joining us as well from the NIH, who has uh, studied Lorene for years and, and worked with her and uh, has some thoughts on how this might be, uh, be useful. So uh, without further ado, why don't I go ahead and introduce um, Lorene and let her take it away. She's got a lot to say and uh, we wanna give her time. And we'll um, go ahead and if you have questions, please put them in the chat. Um, and if they're, you know, Urgent, we'll, uh, we'll interrupt and put them in. If not, um, we'll have plenty of time at the end. Both Lorene and uh, Dr. McGillis are adamant that they want this to be a conversation with everyone um, on the call. So it's yeah. not just them talking at us, but uh, really a conversation. So yes. with that, uh, Lorene, take it away. Right, and Jeff, um, following that point, uh, Jeff was at um, a community meeting in Atlanta in November, I believe, and um, there was a question from the audience, from one of the audience members, why don't we hear more about HIV controllers or long-term non-progressors? And that was an important question because one, I was very grateful to know that it was still um, of interest, you know, to community. And uh, then that it led to Jeff calling me and asking me if I'd be willing to do this webinar. And, and, and really, so that, that's why Stephen and I, Dr. McGillis, um, are interested in, in reserving a lot of time, you know, for, for folks' uh, questions and uh, what are you curious about? But Jeff invited me to talk a little bit about the <clears throat> you know, my diagnosis, which happened in July 1992. Um, I've never um, needed uh, antiretroviral medications that whole time. Um, my first labs, you know, with an with a infectious disease doctor in Sacramento in the early years, about three years into it, um, he, he's the one that originally told me in like 1995, there's something really interesting about your immune system's response to this infection. You know, I, I, I personally in, in my career haven't ever observed that before. And, and he said, I, I really think, and this was really um providential. He says, I, I'm, I'm certain that, there, that somebody's going to want to study you in the future. But he said, there's no studies that I'm aware of. And, and indeed, so from 1995 until 2004, um, when Pause Magazine, I believe, interviewed um, uh, Bruce Walker from, from uh, Harvard, uh, and Massachusetts General Hospital that I was alerted to a study that they were trying to populate with participants. And I remember calling my doctor in Sacramento because I was living and, and working in um, Placerville in the foothills of the Sierras. And uh, I was crying actually, because I said, I think, I think we found the study and, and the rest is history. And I did join Dr. Bruce Walker's study in 2004. Um, the CD4s and CD8s in my case from early days were always in the normal high range. Uh, only later did they actually start creeping up out of the normal range. 
Um, and I think they're still fairly high uh, the last time we checked. Um, viral load tests actually weren't available when I was diagnosed um, and not available um, <clears throat> in clinics until I think it was 1996. And um, so for, for me, uh, one blip in 31 years when I had a bad flu in 2000, yes, Y2K. Um, and that was 93 copies per milliliter. But other than that, um, undetectable, undetectable, and remains undetectable. So unique. From the beginning, I am not on any special diet or supplements. Um, and having joined that first study back in Boston, uh, then I joined one at UC Davis called the Gut Study. Um, and uh, then I, I, I heard about uh, Dr. McGillis' study, and uh, that was 2006 um, that I met him the first time in April of 2006. And I'll never forget it, Stephen. You called. I was working on a landscape design commission when I came to see you the first time in April, and I'll never forget this. You called me. I think in two or three weeks, and you said, we need you back right away. And I'm like, but I'm working on a commission. I have a deadline. He says, we need you back right away. And maybe you can speak to that, because when I did come back in June, you floored me with a film. I think you and Dr. Connors, we were in a little conference room there, an outpatient clinic eight and um my jaw dropped you know i had never heard that this was possible but then i was just kind of beginning to come into your world of scientific study so maybe you might want to mention that if you if you have memory of that because it's just imprinted in my mind and then the rest is history as you publish your papers uh including my case and uh, it's been quite quite a learning experience. And uh, Stephen taught me that what is possible is to create partnership in the study participant research scientist relationship, you know, trustworthy relationships. And uh, eventually that became um, work that I endeavored um, to speak about that in many different situations. And it's a learning experience, I think, for both individuals and always mindful of um, the human, uh, you know, element in, in these relationships. And so that that's a comment I really wanted to make that it's entirely possible. So thank you, Stephen, because you, you got me on a journey that I never once imagined that I'd uh, walk. And, oh, there we are. You have to show this. This is, this is so precious. We are in, it's evening, and we are in the lobby of the second or third floor. I was an inpatient for the first and only time at the NIH because Stephen had messaged me and said, you know, we'd really like to um, do a colonoscopy. It's the only thing that you haven't, you know, you haven't donated um, gut tissues, gut biopsies to our study. And, and, and uh, that evening, I our, story? excuse me, it's not the way I got to get. Go ahead. A, a reminder for everyone to please mute if you're not speaking. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, after I'd recovered from the anesthesia, um, Stephen and his research coordinating nurse, the, the charge nurse came to my room and said, you have visitors. And I'm like, oh, I can go that way. And then I'm facing the right way. There you go. Go ahead, Lorraine. We'll try to find the person who's not muted. And, uh, okay. 
But anyway, um, they imported French cuisine for my dinner. They brought me um, a card, and I think you brought me a cupcake um, because it was my birthday. And this this is the the best example I can give you about what that relationship can become because I was totally Florida. I was totally surprised and it was just so sweet. And I adore that picture, Stephen. I'm glad you have that now. I'm not sure if I ever shared it with you, but um, it's just precious, you know, and uh, very unique, I think. And so there's Nancy and <clears throat> Stephen and I in the lobby. I think I'm getting ready to leave. And, um, you know, what a journey, what a journey and what a delight. Uh, and I was happy, happy to donate whatever it was that Dr. McAllis needed for his study to advance the science. Yeah, Lorraine, so. Lorraine, could you talk a little bit about Zephyr and, and, I will. and our first meeting or the first time I, I, uh, I flew out to you was when we had the Zephyr Shanty uh, joint meeting. And that was really remarkable because I think that was the first of its kind. It was, that was 2009, Stephen, in San Francisco, and you so graciously flew across, across the country. Little known fact, I was so na naive about research, scientific research in general. I mean, I was still on a learning curve that I wasn't aware that you really should. I mean, it's etiquette to offer these brilliant scientists at least a small honorarium. And, and I found that out later and I'm like, oh, what a, what a doofus, you know? But Shanti, an organization in San Francisco co-sponsored co the Zephyr Foundation, um, the Zephyr LTNP Foundation Incorporated, uh, our first paneled public forum. And um, that was filmed and it's on YouTube. I think I still have a Zephyr Foundation channel. I haven't checked it for a while, unfortunately. But um, Stephen was there. Um, I'm forgetting all the the panelists, but um, we Peter, called- Yeah, Peter Hunt and uh, Doug Kwan. Doug Kwan, the, yeah. The, um, Barbara Shacklett. Barbara Shacklett, the famous uh, Jay Levy. Or it was a bit <laughs> Jay Levy. And you know what? I remember Jay sitting next to me before everything started. And he put his hand on my knee and he said, Lorraine, you won't realize till later on how impactful what you've done is, right? That, like you just said, no one's ever done this before. I mean, you know, I, I was just 2005, after a couple trips to Boston and to you, you know, um, an acquaintance of mine on an online forum suggested that I create a nonprofit to represent uh, HIV controllers and LTMPs around the world. And I'm like, I've never done a, a, a nonprofit before, but, but I realized I finally got on the page with all of you that we were not unicorns that we were unique and that we were very hard to find and to have a partner and community do some outreach well uh, my board my original board and i um felt in the last two years that we accomplished the mission that we set out to do and populate your cohorts by that outreach because zephyr I started, I started talking about Zephyr on AIDSmeds.com with 10,000 members. I'm not even sure if AIDSmeds.com is still functioning, but to have access to that many community members, you know, and I just got energy from all of them as I attempted to do something brand new, first of all, and then met LTNPs and HIV controllers on that forum um, got your contact information. And you know what? The, the rest just rolled 
like it was divinely ordered, you know, and it became a full-time job for me. I mean, I had to work a full-time job like on the weekends um, because I couldn't find any grants to support Zeph. But, um, oh my gosh, here's the true gift is all the people that reached out to me on the phone. I mean, from Paris, you know, they'd never shared their status with any family members. They were so grateful when I answered the phone. I'm still hearing from people. I still got an email from a Southern California woman just last week. And, and what's odd is that the website's been dark for several years and we are dissolving um, formally the, the 5013C, but um, I estimate that I probably uh, had direct contact with near 350 individuals who I felt after you trained me, because all of you did make me your student, met the parameters, the clinical parameters of uh, LTMP, um, elite controller or viremic controller, you know. And, and so that was the miracle. That was the outreach tangibly affecting my life. And what a joy it was. I mean, I just never knew. I just never knew. And so um, referring everyone to the world studies, not just here in the U.S., but Italy and Spain, you know, because there's 22 countries that eventually um, developed uh, cohorts to study us. And I was tracking all that stuff. And what was really cool with our website is learn how to track the back end and see who was um, accessing the website and how many countries and how many languages. And it was truly worldwide. This little kernel of I can help you, but gee, I'm not publicly disclosed. So that might be something I have to deal with. I didn't disclose publicly for 14 years. And I lived in a really seriously conservative redneck foothills community. And I had a business I was running. I mean, I had people on a payroll and I just stepped out, you know, I just stepped out, called the local little mountain Democrat newspaper and said, um, how would you like an interview? You've never done one, but how would you like to do an interview and then publish an article uh, having a discussion with an HIV positive woman up here? <laughs> and that's how I went public. And that thing turned into a three paper series in August of 2006, which was really good because that August, Bruce Walker flew me to the Toronto International AIDS Conference to do what? To speak in front of the world press about his search for HIV control. And so, see, there, there was just the synchronicity and flow, and I knew that I was right to disclose. I mean, I didn't want to live behind that sh veil of secrecy anymore. I mean, you know, I was out there with a business and doing community plantings for the city of Placerville on Main Street and was well known. And I didn't want to live with the secret. I mean, it didn't make sense to me anymore. And that right there was a huge healing, I think. And uh, that's actually around the time that those CD4s started to escalate, you know, something, some, some commentary then on, you know, emotional uh, growth or letting go of a secret, you know, and, and, and just uh, empowering yourself, right? Empowering yourself and just say, hey, you know, I don't want you to hold that over me because, you know, it, it's, it's it's harmful to stay in the closet, to stay with a secret. I mean, because it's ever present and ever pressuring and stressful.
you know, stressful because you're not authentic. And, and all of you just helped me on that journey. And the, 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 the longer it went, the stronger I got. And whether that's contributed to um, this phenomena that you and others still have not yet defined, you know, how did her immune system do what she did recently? I mean, or was it soon after the infection? You know, all these questions. But I understand science can sometimes, I mean, look at us. Almost 20 years, 17 years for sure. And you're just dedicated and stay with it and observe changes. And, you know, and I know we're all very, very anxious for a cure for this virus. But um, we have to be patient. I know it's been 40 years, but Dr. McGillis has dedicated his entire career to the study of HIV at the NIH. And um, he's a captain in the public health service. <laughs> it has been for quite a while. So other than that, um, that's a little bit about Zephyr. Um, we did do another educational panel in San Francisco. Um, and we did call, I wanted to do a series, and I did talk to Dr. Walker about taking quadrants of the U.S. and continuing them, um, you know, like yearly or so, but that never came to fruition. But we did call that Unlocking the Secret of HIV Controllers. And um, that was a name that my brilliant friend, Jeff Kurtzen, came up with, one of my founding board members for Zephyr. And um, he was also the um, visionary behind Zephyr Foundation's website. He's all things techie, you know. And um, that's, that's what launched uh, a vocation that I never expected um, that would actually be the catalyst for my retiring from my landscape contracting company that I had operated for over 22 years. And moving to Sacramento, which is the flatlands to me, and I avoided it like the plague because I was a mountain woman, you know, cut my own firewood and... You know, my sisters just laugh. They're like, oh, you fit right in. You know, you fit right into the woods here, girl. <laughs> but um, I had to get closer to the airport because I was flying back to yours and Bruce's study, you know, sometimes, particularly with you, a couple times a year. And I also had to get closer to the Amtrak because, as Jeff will tell you, we had meetings for AIDS Treatment Activist Coalition Um all over the place and i was flying across the country for those two i think there was actually literally one year that i had not traveled for three months out of that year going somewhere study um and uh it made it kind of hard to make a living but uh you know what um it was a labor of love as jeff and i said yesterday I had to walk toward it. I couldn't ignore it. Um, Dr. McGillis and Dr. Walker and Barbara Shacklett and Doug Kwan, uh, Dr. Deeks in San Francisco, um, bless your hearts. You were just so dedicated to finding the answer that can somehow be shared with folks that aren't as fortunate. And, you know, uh, frankly, um, I, I just adore all of you, you know, not to get too, you know, warm and fuzzy, but um, that's how I feel after all these many years of, of working with you. And that's what it's been, working great, with you. Very mutual, yeah. yeah. So, so I know that Stephen wants to talk a little bit. Um, I really appreciate the, con the dialogue. Oh, this is what I, what I wanted to say, the last bullet point on my personal list. Look, the dialogue about my case, cure, clearance, or remission continues. 
Um, Stephen and I have had a conversation running since 2008. Um, and he'll tell you what he told a film crew back in 2016 when they asked me, I hope, kind sir, what it, on film, on camera, um, how it felt to be cured. And what I did after I asked them to stop the cameras. Because what you told them, I think, will make folks here today um, understand that sometimes science is not exact. Sometimes science is not exact and, and, and we have to be careful, mainly because I do not want to create false hope for folks. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not being judgmental about the use of cheer in my case. It's just that I'm a little bit uncomfortable with it. Um, uh, it's pretty big, you know, and uh, it, it's a joy to think of that. But um, it can be a burden as well. You know, it can be a burden as well. Because folks look to you like you're some, hmm, I don't even know. I can't even put words on it. But it's just, can be difficult. So with that, I'll turn it over to my friend, Dr. Stephen McGillis. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Laureen. That's yeah. a wonderful story. And you'll see we have some uh, questions in the chat that have been coming up. So uh, yes. but now we'll turn to Dr. McGillis and he can kind of tell his researcher side of the story and then we'll get yeah. into the conversation. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I'll just comment a little bit about you. You had asked me to tell my my story in terms of, you know, how I got to uh, be interested in studying HIV related research. And that for me, I had never uh you know that question, I always tell my students, you know that question where they say, where do you envision yourself being in 10 to 20 years? I would have never imagined it would be this spot, not because of HIV, but because I just never liked lab-based research. I was not the guy in undergrad or med school that was excited about oh. pipetting and all. it just wasn't my thing. I was always questioning myself, felt like I wasn't very good at it. I, I actually thought I wasn't smart enough to really do it. So I, I went to med school and did my thing. And it was, uh, this was in the early nineties and on my clinical rotations and my clerkships saw this was in, in Miami where I'm from at university of Miami, uh, the wards filled with people who were suffering from, from HIV. And I thought, you know, this is something that should motivate everybody to be interested in how we could solve this. This is like the scourge of our lifetime, uh, which is how it felt to me then. And so I moved up to D.C. and I did my residency at Georgetown and it was the same thing. The wards were filled with people and we would put out little fires and then they would come back and it would be a catastrophic medical event. And it was just soul crushing. Everybody was burned out. We were just struggling. All the nurses and, and uh, the other caregivers we were just struggling to try to figure out how to you know, fix this problem. And that's when I was very motivated to, to do to actually make a decision to go into infectious diseases and also to figure out if I could do research. And I started dabbling in some projects during my residency where I at least could learn how to pipette, you know, yeah. and make sure I could do it. And uh, and then the, the the beautiful thing about me winding up at Georgetown, because it wasn't my first choice, was that I had proximity to NIH and I did a rotation here in my third, in my second year, and I was blown away. You know, I had heard all these preconceived all these ideas, you know, notions about, oh, they're, they're great at science, but they're, you know, they're kind of lab ratty. They're maybe not so clinically savvy. I came, I was blown away. I couldn't believe how smart everybody was and how they could be at the bedside and show compassion and be great caregivers. And then also be asking really cutting edge questions and know how to take those questions apart. And I thought, I want to grow up and be just like these people. So I did my, my, I, I got lucky. I wanted being able to do my fellowship here and in my first year, you have to pick a lab. And I'd had this experience as a third year resident where I'd admitted a woman from the emergency room at Georgetown in the ER. And she was very sick and had a febrile illness and we weren't sure what it was. And then we figured out she probably had an acute retroviral syndrome. So she had just acquired HIV and we took care of her. We ruled out everything. And I was the, the resident, you know, I was the third year resident. So I was like running the team with the attending. And then I saw her in follow-up in my clinic 
And this was, and as Lorraine was pointing out, this was like 96, 90, 95, 96. Um, we had just were able to do viral load testing. And even though her HIV test had was became positive, so she had seroconverted, she had, you know, no detectable viral load. And I remember the attending that was staffing this was that I presented to said, oh, that must be a false negative. I mean, a false positive. You know, her test wasn't real. She probably didn't have HIV. And I thought that doesn't really make sense. We ruled out all of the other things. There are some right. possibilities, but you know, it just it, it just really stuck with me. And I followed her a couple of times before I left Georgetown. And uh, you know, she had a her CD4 count was mid-range, but we were never able to detect her viral. And then, you know, the assays weren't as sensitive as they are now. Right. But her HIV test remained positive. And I thought, wouldn't that be amazing if she was without meds? you know, had this low viral load. So I came, I came down IH, I interviewed with 24 labs. I met Mark Connors, who was a young investigator and was very interested in understanding immune control and HIV. I'd never even heard anybody talk about that and had th samples from three people, three white men, all, all three Irish American descent and was asking the same question. He had basically three people who had been alive for 15 years had very people they loved. They had this, you know, desire to contribute to, to be beacons of hope and to figure out, you know, they wanted insight into their disease, and they and they were generously donating, the, you know, their their immune system from uh, from peripheral blood draws. And Mark said, and Mark had experience in kids with RSV, looking at mm. RSV specific T cell immunity, and was wow. recruited recruited to look at T cell responses in HIV, people are looking at antibodies to kind of like COVID, you know, 20 years ago, that's how COVID is now. And so he started doing this and I thought, this is the holy grail. If we could figure out natural, spontaneous control over HIV, that would be so important. And so that addresses the question of what can we learn? We can learn an enormous amount. If we can understand an immediate control, the implications are huge and we can spend more time talking about it. But that's what motivated me to want to join the lab and so i did and mark took me as a as a second year id fellow we couldn't get enough samples from the few people that we had identified as being controllers so we started presenting cases locally and trying to get people to find you know uh people with control in their practice that we could potentially you know bring to nih so i wrote a protocol this was in 1998 99 um the protocol was eventually approved uh, i eventually took over as the pi of the city but this was all with mark connors this was really wow. he had already gotten things going and i felt really fortunate i was very lucky to be at that place at that time and to be able to and together the questions we asked and i'll never forget i even have somewhere the original notes i took as a new lab member of it could be all these things. It could be the virus. It could be the immune system. It could be something in between host genetics. You know, the sky's the limit. There's some data. Um, but the first thing that we did was, and I'll touch a little bit, as I said, that I don't, I don't like talking about the name, you know, what, what's the right name. But the first thing we agreed on was we needed a stringent case definition, right? There, Frank Miedema in the, in the Netherlands had, had written this really nice review on long-term survivors before I joined the lab, this was in like 1995. And it said, all the people who have been alive this long without meds, it's probably a heterogeneous group, but there are probably some within that group that have truly non-progressive infection and suspect they're the people that have low viral loads. So we thought, okay, it's kind of a no brainer. We're going to try to really understand not to discriminate, but to really focus on the group that has what looks like high level control versus others. Let's just use a very strict definition. They have to have a viral load that's undetectable, stable CD4 counts. Let's follow them for some time to make sure they get to us and that things are stable. And that's what we just, we applied that logic and we started doing that. And doing that in the first group that we grew, you know, in terms of our cohort, growing our cohort, enrolling people, we found this association with B57, which is a, you know, a gene and Loreen has that gene. And it's one that is not the answer. It's neither necessary nor sufficient for control, but we found it, it's present in 10% of people in North America. We found it in 11 out of 13 of the first 13 people that we wow. enrolled. And we thought this is the most polymorphic locus in the human immune system on chromosome six. And for 11 of 13 of them to have that, right. that's a gift. Like that's a, that's an, ins that's a, that's a secret. That's a, uh, insight right. and suggested because that 
protein sits on the surface of all the cells in your body with the nucleus, which is almost everything, and presents pieces of the virus to CD8s, the CD8s were probably important. And there was some other data supporting that. So we went into this deep dive and said, let's take this apart. Other people were doing this too, and they were looking at it different ways, but this was our, our approach. So what we learned, and this was, we, Lorene was enrolled in the study at a point where we had a very engaged study coordinator who was amazing, Nancy Colliano, she was in the picture. She really breathed a lot of life into the study, helped us get things really rolling. And we also get, got a recruiter in the clinic to help us reach out further. And that's how, kind of how we found Lorene too, because we started advertising and you know trying to get more people to, to participate. So, um, and forgive me with for like my being my jaws chatting. My office is freezing. I might even put another layer on oh. in a second. Oh. But that's why I'm drinking tea. So forgive me. I just can't get it warm enough. Um, so anyway, um, so that that's that's kind of my has been my focal point. And as Re Lorraine can tell you, I'm a little intense. That yeah, I could say every waking hour of every day for a good twenty something years. Mark and I have been grappling with like. You know, others have too. you know, we're all, everybody's, you know, I think a lot of people have identified this as important, but the thing about Lorene, I want to emphasize that was different. And I don't think we have to talk about cure or remission or whatever, but the thing that was different was another unique feature. So not only was she a member of a group that represents less than 0.5% of infected people, not only was she one of them that carried B57, not only was she one of them that when we did single copy viral load measurements, which we did in just a snapshot of our cohort at when we got past like 60 or 70 people, we found that a third of them have a viral load of less than one copy, which is the same as a, 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 a gender matched age matched group of people on therapy. Not so everybody on therapy is not suppressed to less than one copy. They're, they're kind of, there's kind of a range, the same for people with spontaneous control. So they had the same viral loads. Laureen was one of the ones in that third that had less than one copy. But the other thing that was unusual when we went back, because we left no stone unturned, was let's look at even some of the basic things. So we went back and we looked at everybody's HIV Western blot, you know, the confirmatory test back in the day when you get an HIV test. And the thing that was peculiar was everybody we had enrolled who was a, you know, a high level controller had a fully developed Western blot. So everybody's fully infected in their antibodies make you know your their their pla their b cells differentiate into plasma cells into antibody factories and they make a bunch of antibodies and the antibodies are targeting the virus are probably not doing a lot in terms of controlling the virus so everybody had this fully developed western blood and there were two people in our study one of one of whom was Lorraine, who had this very weird western blood that it only had a couple of very faint bands like it was almost it was kind of indeterminate but it met criteria if you applied stringent criteria for being positive, but it looked very peculiar. We found one other person, and then we got two referrals around the same time, and they had the same thing. So there were four people who had this very peculiar phenotype. And that became a side project for me. I was interested mm -hmm. in these outliers of outliers, right. looking at them. And what we found were some things that suggested they had some of the same features as the other elite controllers, but maybe they were even higher level controller. So we started calling them to, you know, and it's not, it sounds elitist. I hate using all these terms. I don't like the term the way control, but we started using, trying to say these were like exceptional or extreme controllers because they were at the stream, extreme end of the distribution. And we found some very cool things. And that's where we did a very deep dive in looking at the reservoir and found that Lorene, whom we had samples from lymph node and, and gut tissue and a lot of large volumes from leukopheresis. We couldn't, we found a few vestiges of a reservoir, but not a lot. And, and described in that paper that she had an extraordinarily small, you know, exceptionally small viral reservoir. And it seemed like her immune system hadn't seen HIV in a long time, but when we stimulated it in, in vitro, it went gangbusters and divided and loaded its bullets, you know, CD8s kill, loaded with killing proteins and killed beautifully like everybody else supporting that she had been infected at some point you know we had evidence that she had that there was no, an earlier infection in that but she just really and there was a, another person who was b57 also all their labs looked a lot very much the same 
So to, we didn't sample everything, right? You, we, did, we can't sample brain and we can't sample elements of the genital tract. There are these sanctuary sites where we know that uh, resting CD4 is trafficked to. So being careful, we did not use the word cure because we cannot prove cure. But there is really great evidence that there is very little antigen in Lorene, and there is still a pretty good immune response in Lorene. And so we went. In, we said it, what we felt comfortable saying, based on the facts that we could prove. You know, the evidence that we could generate. So I, I've said a lot. So I'll, I'll I'll pause there and see if there are any questions. But uh, it's it's been an honor. It's been my my honor uh, in my life to know you and to do this work. And now you're going to make me cry. Oh. This is why I can't. I look at you, and you bring, you get all the you know all the emotional juices flowing. <laughs> <laughs> I love you too, man. Thank you both. This has been amazing, and thank you for kind of setting the stage on you know what happened and kind of how we got to where we are, and kind yeah. of what the the scientific consensus is around uh, Lorene's case. Um, you know, you mentioned Dr. McGillis, and and. and Lorraine mentioned this earlier, you both touched on the idea of language and how do we define controllers and the various levels of controllers. So I'd love to get both kind of your scientific take on what it is and then Lorraine's, you know, thoughts on what it's like to be a person having these labels applied to her in the press and in the media and uh, kind of what that's like. And if you have any preferences on what you think a more accurate, um, you know, and better terminology might be. Um, Lorraine, how do you want to do that? You want to go first? Yeah, why don't you go, you go first? Huh? No, it's good. I, I'm really curious to hear you answer that. So that comes up a lot. You know, is, is a long-term survivor or a long-term non-progressor the same as an HIV controller, which the French use first, an elite suppressor, which Hopkins used very early, an elite controller, which Steve Deeks and Bruce Walker started to use around the same time a little bit later, um, we did a review in, in 2010 where we looked at the seven or eight uh, largest cohorts uh, were, were the most active because some of them didn't have very high numbers to see, you know, what how were people defining them. And there was some variability in the case definition. Um, the original elite controller case definition was you had to have at least two out of three viral loads at least over a year below the lower limit of detection and ultra-sensitive assay and be healthy and off meds. And that was it. There was no CD4 inclusion and there was no, you know, longer follow-up. There were some, like our cohort, we made sure people were stable three to five years, had CD4s that were non-declining uh, and had most of their viral loads where there were no technical. So there was some slight variation and there was differences in the composition, the, co the cohort in San Francisco, if I remember correctly, and this was from Peter Hunt and, and Steve Deek's data, um, I, I'm a big fan of Steve Deek. He's an amazing guy. I've known him for a long time. Uh, he's a great, great scientist. Bless you, sweetheart. Um, they, uh, they in their cohort, in, in, in with in terms of immune activation, they had, it was a small size, and it was a lot of women that were co-infected with HCV. So it was a, a cohort with a lot of activation for a lot of reasons. So, you know, I, I think I interpreted that with with more caution. Um, uh, but, and Bruce Walker has some data that's very similar to ours. So people, I think what, if I had to summarize it, we felt like we didn't need to change the name. We just needed to change the definition. We just needed, because those with truly non-progressive infection had viral loads that were detectable. Let's have a more strict case definition regarding viral loads. Other people felt like it was cleaner to have a new group with a new name, because then you didn't muddy the waters by trying to make comparisons with older heterogeneous cohorts. Um, it wound up creating confusion anyway, because people would say, well, you're finding data that's very similar to what other people that called them LTMPs found. They just, you're just giving them a different name because your case definitions are very similar. So it, it's become supernova in terms of making things very challenging to talk about. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think if we're clear about the definition, you will find similarities and there is consensus about a lot of um, what people do agree on. And do you have a term you prefer to use? Uh, 
We just use controller um, just as, as our generic term um, or, or I, I'm, still, I'm old school. I still refer to um, individuals in our cohort as non-progressors, knowing that, you know, um, what our definition is. We've actually used a hybrid term to try to be all inclusive in our papers where we say LTMP, EC, and then we define them. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like shows we're not excluding the early, we're not disregarding the earlier data. Right. We're just make, you know making sure that we're clear in our definition. So, and the EC is for elite controller or? Okay. Yeah, right. so you're using the, the term. And then do you have a preference if you got to decide what these things would be and uh, how you would like to refer to someone like uh, Lorene? I'd like to not use any label. I wish we could just, you know, uh, I, I don't know an answer to that. I just do, yeah. it, it just rubs me wrong to to call elite controller, you know. And 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 actually, when I talked to Steve Deeks about it in San Francisco a while back at a conference, he said we actually got that term from Tony Fauci. Oh. <laughs> and I thought that was so funny because I've worked for Dr. Fauci for twenty five years, and so. And I went back and he think, and you know, maybe there, it was in some document based on, you know, so we, I don't really oh, even, wow. I don't think we really even know where it came from, but um, it stuck because it, people knew you were talking about these extremely small, this extremely mm -hmm. rare people. And so Lorraine, it is the person who's having these labels applied to you, you know, by scientists and in the papers and then by the media, you know, what was that like for you and, and, and what would you, Think would be the most the useful language to use in these in cases like yours well i i just let me interject that um recently and i'm talking about when bruce walker's team published that article in the journal nature you you know talking about how my immune system kind of sequestered HIV into a non-coding region of the human chromosome, you know, calling that space a genetic desert, you know, which I thought was quite dramatic. I mean, how do you explain that in layperson language? John Cohen actually did it best. He goes, I know, Lorraine. He said, it's like you're partying in Vegas and you're driving around this gold Cadillac, right? And uh, you run out of gas in a territory outside the city limits and there's no gas stations. You can't go anywhere. And I went, that's brilliant. You know, can't replicate, can't guess up, guess up to go to the next party. You know, you're stuck. And that's essentially, I think, the best way I've heard anybody describe that. But um, Steve, uh, bless his heart, he sent me a short email after that article came out, he goes, I was at a conference, Lorene, and do you know that you're a single brand name now? And I'm like, <laughs> and then he, in quotes, he goes, like Oprah. And I went, really? I mean, it was just so weird to hear that. So, you know, LOL, back, back and forth. So um, category of one. It, it's, you know, and, and, and bowing to uh, Esperanza patient. And I hope she doesn't go public, by the way. She's a mom. She got a couple babies and, you know, her culture disclosing publicly is very difficult in her culture. But I hope, and I'll say it to all of you, that for her anyway, when she reads something about me, that it gives her hope because she was diagnosed in 2013, that my 31 years gives her hope that she'll, you know, have a long life, right? And, um, but, but I wanted to say about these monikers, these names, I actually, with Richard Jeffries, started a list you know, I think I started it way back in like 06 or 07, Zephyr uh, data. Um, and doggone, I can't remember where I filed it because I've been looking. But it was 43 different names from various papers and countries and you know, natural suppressors and neutralizers and I don't know, but 43, you know, and, and, and so... 
Um, the only one <clears throat> through all my time doing this work, I, I actually pull out a dictionary. And I talked to Michael Luella about this on the phone. Um, HIV neutralizers, because that's the action I think that's taking place. I mean, we're just neutralizing the virus. I don't know how Stephen feels about that, but I think that came from a study in Paris, you know? And they're, using that, they're using that though for a different indication. They're, oh, they're are they? They're using elite, con they're using the elite controller phenotype uh, with the understanding that it's probably a T cell phenomenon to say oh. there are also people who make neutralizing antibodies and those who have neutralized oh. antibodies that neutralize a lot of variants okay. do so very potently okay. with, a very, with a very small concentration. They're calling them elite neutralizers to kind okay. of show parallel that they have really good broad and potent neutralization capacity in their B cell compartment like right. elite controllers have in terms of controlling HIV replication in their T cell compartment. Okay. Uh, I got that. I should have thought about that. No, no, no. It's just, but, it's confusing because I'm, I, I think in a couple of places, which is probably where you got this, people have used that for both. And I don't think that's exactly, think that, that's yeah. very tricky. Yeah. So, well, see, this is a side tangent, right? That, that, that we could continue the conversation about because I can speak what I can speak to with certainty is the impact of these 43 names um, on community members who would call me desperate to contribute, wanting to contribute. Their hearts were set on it. They were almost desperate in some cases um, and wanted a certain definition so in their hearts they could understand that they met the criteria. Where they fit in, yeah, yeah. And we're talking slow progressors, which came out of Trudeau, you know, uh, Canada. Um, I'm forgetting her first name, but uh, the slow progressors, that's yet another subsection of controllers. And, and I think they started their uh, cohort like back in the early 2000s as well. And, and so it was... It was disconcerting for me as kind of the gatekeeper, if you will. Um, with great humility, I say that because I did feel like a den mother, you know, for the community. I mean, they trusted me. The gentleman from Paris, you know, who called me, he knew that I would never share that information with anyone. Never, you know. Um, and, but I couldn't, you know, to the best of my ability, I would, that's when I was really your student and reading, I taught myself how to read your articles, you know, I, I can't even tell you. And, and what a wonderful thing to realize that I had a, a scientific mind, this plant lady this horticulturalist, you know, this botanist. And um, I always felt like I had a really firm handle on what you were talking about, Steve Deeks, all of you, that I could share in layperson's, you know, language. But you have the gift of narrative, Stephen. That, that's why I told Jeff we must ask, you know, Stephen to join us. Thank you. Because most of it just, you know, B cells and, and one copy per milliliter. I mean, that's just a mind blower. You know, what does that mean? Uh, uh, but, but the uncomfortability of these many names or labels were very tough on people because they're so desperate for an answer, you know, and will they accept me? Um, can I join their study? And I'd always say, you know, just like with Nancy, when she was your research coordinator, she's such a love, just call that number or just send an email to this, you know, address and you'll find out, they'll embrace you, you know, and they'll do a screening. 
And and so again, this this mechanism at work in my body may or may not ever be defined. You know, that that's where the humility comes in. You know, we we people, particularly in the U.S., just want that answer. You know, we want it right away. And uh, I don't know. I don't I'd know. Like to, I, I'd like to speak to that for a minute. If, if yeah. I'm, is that okay, Jeff? No, please. Oh, for this sure. Your conversation. The thing that we the thing that we've learned, and I, and I'll I won't speak for other labs, but the th the thing that Mark and I have learned. And we think it's been a really important piece of immunobiology. We've learned from you and from our cohort uh, of people who have been, you know, uh, amazing and have come to NIH once or twice a year. You know, the pandemic shut us down a bit because they were prioritizing other other uh, protocols for people who needed, you know, vaccines or had needed care. Um, but we're we're back up and running. But for before that. I saw all of you once or twice a year for a very long time, for 20 something years. I, I used to, the, the, my joke used to be, I see some of you more than frequently. I see some of my close friends that I don't get to, you know, get to see. Yeah. So we become, you know, we become fun. But the point is that that people would commit and they would, uh, you know, donate to the study. And we learned so much and we kind of built on things. We realized that in most cases, there is a, a common mechanism. It's not just that everybody has a little bit of something else. It appears and the people that we've studied that there is, we found a common, we believe there's a common mechanism that's operative and it's immune control. It's mediated by the immune system. It's T cell mediated. The CD8s, your CD8s, when they see the virus get activated, they divide. As they divide, they become really good at loading their, their killing machinery with bullets, with, with killing proteins, cytotoxic proteins. And then they, make a conjugate, the CD8 comes up and it binds to the infected target and it delivers a lethal hit and it kills that. That killing function, there are, not to say there are not other things that are unique, but the thing that we've been impressed by, when you take cells from someone like you and you put them in a dish with HIV, within 30 minutes, they wipe out most of the infected cells. When you do this with cells from other people on, on SCR viral therapy, <coughs> infection, you don't see that. There's a big difference there. the The question is, how, what do we do with that? You know, is it useless? Like you're a rare, rare, you know, person. You represent less than 0.5 percent of people. Is there a reason that that could be still provide an answer, or provide hope to other people? I think a hundred percent. What it does is it says that if you want to make a vaccine that's effective. You need to figure out why the vaccines to date have not been effective. And we've done, we actually have a paper coming out Friday where we did that. We took responses from people like you and compared the recipients of different HIV vaccines that were thought to be great candidates, but failed and figured out what the difference, what the defect was, why we think they failed, you know? And so that's really important in terms of retooling and re-strategizing what would be an effective HIV platform. So that's for a vaccine, and that could be a therapeutic vaccine to take somebody who's already infected and yeah. need to cure. So it could be a cure strategy, but in the true sense of the term, it's vaccines. Lewis Picker has data in the rhesus macaque model. He's cured 55% of the, the rhesus macaques that he's infected oh. with HIV and given them a CMV-based vector. And these animals clear HIV. There's reason to believe the mechanism is a little different, but it still appears to be mediated by CD8s. So there's proof of principle that yeah. we use a T cell based vaccine to be prophylactic ish, meaning prevent you from having durable infection. Yeah. There, the, the big thing that comes up though is what about specific cure things? Well, as you know, I don't want to get into all, I'm not a reservoir expert. But we know from studying your reservoir and the reservoir of the elite controllers, controllers in our cohort, and collaborating with people like Una Doherty at Penn and Frank Maldarelli, who's at NIH, who have been very committed to studying the reservoir and, and people with HIV. Um, given Una samples also no. for from people on on antiretroviral therapy. The point there is one one approach is the shock and kill approach. Give a latency reversing agent to get the virus out, get it to replicate and then have something come in that cleans up and clears all those infected cells, right? 
well, you, to do that, you need to have good killers. And the assumption from that is that most people have CD8s that are pretty good killers and they don't. We know that they they kill okay. They keep the virus at bay a bit, but they're not, they don't kill to the same level as the cells from someone like, and someone like Lorene. So we think we can learn a lot mm-hmm. to inform that. Even this other strategy, which is very different, which stemmed from the paper that Lorene contributed to and was highlighted in, which is this, uh, uh, you know, block and lock kind of shutting and silencing the, you know, the, the, the interpretation of that I won't get into because I don't really interpret the data the same way that, that the authors did. I think it's still a, a, a great piece of work. But the, the, what's a, the model that's come out of that is, could we go in and use some epigenetic tool to silence the, the reservoir that's there and block its ability vis-a-vis the analogy you just gave of making re- you know replication competent virus downstream. And there's some interesting strategies that people are exploring for that. There's an argument you can do both together, but something that could help that process would be having a good set of specific killers to come along and mediate their effect. And so I think it has huge implications of what we've learned from people like you that I think it's not even yet to be appreciated yet, uh, I think in the field. And so again, uh, you know, you made this possible and, and, and your brothers and sisters that have donated so generously, their immune system, their time, their interest, um, you know, it, it, it's really important. Well, thank you for that, hon. I really appreciate that. Yeah. You know, you highlight this and it's, I mean, we now have a huge investment in cure research as a result of all this, looking at all these various approaches yeah. one by one and in combinations through the Delaney uh, collaboratories. You know, it started about 12, 13 years ago with three collaboratories for a five-year cycle. It got refunded. And then initially, this was part of the Obama $100 million for an HIV cure initiative, right? That uh, you know, we need to kind of give props to the politicians who who <laughs> make this possible with the funding, right? Now, nothing happens without money. Mm-hmm. And now there are 10, currently 10 different collaboratories looking at a variety of approaches and combinations, some of which are these I put in the chat. Um, the B-cell approach that uh, Paula Cannon at the Red Collaboratory in USC is looking at. So it's uh, yeah, it's amazing to see where we've come. We're not there yet, but there's, there's so much happening. One question that came up in the chat uh, for both Lorene and, and Dr. McGillis is about um, there was an ACTG study a while back that showed that pe- long-term non-progressors um, did better if they were on antiretrovirals um, because of the ongoing chronic inflammation that uh, some have. Um, so, Lorene, in your journey during all this, um, back when you still had a little bit of detectable virus, or even before, did they ever tell you you should start a meds and kind of what was that like for you? No. No. No, because it, in, in, you know, I was asking Stephen about it and Bruce and Steve Deeks, uh, Barb Shacklett, uh, and they're like, you don't, you don't need them. Yeah. Well, and we are we professional. Did, Go ahead. huh? No, we just, we discussed the results, you know, cause a lot of, a lot of the early, there were some early papers that were done. Um, you know, all of the samples are small because you're a rare group of people, but there was some data suggesting that there was more immune activation. And then there were some inferences or, or, you know, um, that there would be more inflammation and then more, disease. And there were some problems with some of those early papers in terms of the the generalizability of that data. I mean, I'm, I'm being vague, but, but my point is that in terms of clinical outcomes, there was one paper that showed that elite controllers get hospitalized more than people on antiretroviral therapy. The problem is, and, and the, the cause was, were cardiovascular events. In that paper, they didn't control for smoking, which is an important risk factor for cardiovascular events. So that was I think a major problem in terms of the conclusions of that. So, so, and then in terms of, you know, rushing on therapy, what I've said and what we've done and what I think I've done with you multiple times is whatever papers come out, we go through the papers together and you make your own decision. The guidelines right now, I work for the U S government. I retired from the public health service, but I'm still an NIH employee. We have guidelines and the guidelines suggest that everybody think about starting meds even if, you know, including people with 
spontaneous control over HIV. And I don't think that's wrong. So I don't want to act, mm -hmm. misrepresent and say that I'm encouraging everybody to do it. But it's a personal decision. You know, guidelines are written for communities, not for individuals. And you are an individual with a very unique story. And so what's been great for you is that you have caregivers who have considered your case specifically and said, you know, there there might be an advantage to starting. Um, you have without it for a long time, you haven't had any major problems. You know, your CD4 counts are higher than most people who don't have HIV. Um, you know, let, let, let's consider. And, and many of our patients, we've gotten to a point at NIH where we've suggested more and more people start because if you have lips or you have any, any evidence of CD4, you know, we not only tell you here's the data, we actually strongly encourage you to start. A lot of our patients have said, it ain't broke. I'm not, it's, you know, I don't need yeah. it. I'm not going to, I've been this fine for this long. I don't. Yeah. And so it's a personal choice, you know, it's a, a personal decision. So it's very challenging. Um, and of course, we don't, don't want to hurt anybody. So you don't want to sure. also be overly, you don't want to be rebellious and say, oh, you don't need it. Um, right. But, but we don't know. I, I think we still, it's beyond what we know, really, for sure. Interesting. Thanks for that. So, questions. Questions. yeah, go ahead. So, there's one from um, yeah, Linda for, for Loreen about um, where you get the courage and perseverance to keep on keeping on, you know, throughout your journey, right? It's been a long, long journey, and uh, you've done a lot. I mean, it's some really amazing things above and beyond. You know, most people would just say, well, this is a wonderful gift and and appreciate it and, and live their lives. And you've done so much more. And you know, what gave you the impetus to, to do that, to come out publicly and, and do what you've done? And to keep it up, poke, being poked and prodded all these years. <laughs> right. It's an easy answer. For the love of community, which I'm a part of, despite this really unique response to HIV and, and also standing at the graves of many friends and the dark days. Mm. I do it in their memory. There were too many. Um, I saw the ravages on some from AZT, um, just about killed them. <laughs> and so those two combined, not to mention a huge inspiration is folks like you. I mean, where do you get the stamina, the energy to wake up and do the work, do the advocacy, you know, for, for more years than I've done it. And um, I, I think that we have huge hearts and felt that we could make a difference in some small way. That's how I started out. And uh, how, to, how to leave the world a better place than I entered. So that's what I can say about that. Thank well, you've planted a lot of trees and, and this is one of the most, uh, one of the most valuable and, and uh, compelling, I think. Thank, Thank you. you for that. Yeah. Getting me off for clipped as well. <laughs> <laughs> so what you else? know, Dr. McGillis, you talked about your story and, and you know, as, as a young doctor, you know, seeing what you call the scourge and, uh, you know, how it compelled you to, 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 to join this field and become not just a provider, but a researcher to try to find some answers. So sitting where we are today, learning what we've learned from Lorene and others like her, kind of where, do, as a researcher, and somebody sitting in the NIH where most of this happens, where do you see this going? What would you like to see? Both, you know, where do you see it going practically in the near term? And then, you know, if you had um, things to be exactly as you wanted, how would you, uh, how would you want that to, to happen? I, on the, on the same path they are, I mean, uh, I, it's been really full disclosure. I'm actually moving into a new position at NIH. I'm staying at NIH and moving into a new position that's going to broaden and look at. Uh, it's going to be more of a um, global infectious disease uh, focus. 
but the lab itself, which has always been Mark Connor's lab, um, will remain here. There is a, a mentee of mine who is one of the smartest people I know, Dan Rogan, who's taking over as PI of the protocol. I'm remaining as a uh, associate investigator on the protocol, which is I'm very honored and, and happy that they were able to, to uh, invite me and to let me do that. Um, and so the direction that the lab is going in, and I'll just speak again about this, I'm not to discredit anybody else or act like it's, you know, to, to hype it up more than anybody else, but it's what I know because it's where I've been for a very long time. The, the Where we are with the next piece, we had been talking for so long about when people come to us 20 years after being affected saying, um, help me understand how I'm able to be okay. You know, one of the things I always say, Lori might remember this, my first question was, is, what's your belief system? How do you think, why do you think you're so resilient and you're here right now? And the answers we've gotten it will blow you away. Like it's so, it's such insight and such, you know, it's, it's really like a, an interesting piece of, of um, humanity to hear what people think, how they were able to, to you know, be at this point. And, and I, you've, you've seen, heard it for the last hour from Lorene in, in real time. So it, um, we tried to understand how can we distinguish where you are, where your immune system is right now and interact with HIV with other people who don't, aren't as lucky and don't have the same outcome. And so we've done that and we've got, we've learned a lot from that. We as a field, I've learned a lot from that. People doing other things and looking at other pieces of it. Now we're at the point of how did that get induced? You know, how did that get primed to lead to this? Let's go back and try to mimic what goes on early on. Cause we know that the path of divergence to being on the non, you know, the controller path versus mm -hmm. the, the typical path start happens very early. So how do we figure that out? Those are questions that our lab has been trying to answer and is working on. Also, what are the genetic factors operative later? You know, what, are they, what, what, is, what is the real, um, are there ways we could perturb that and, and add things in and out and, and figure that out? And then how do we apply that in a bigger scheme to, to help everybody living with HIV? And so those types of things are being done by a lot of people. There, fortunately, there's a lot of interest and a lot of resources to continue to move forward. That I believe wholeheartedly in the direction Mark is taking, and and a lot of it's been, you know, our, our what we've been doing together for a very long time. So I, I think that there is continued reason. I mean, I always say to our patients and to my students, you know, I feel honored every day to drive into this building because I'm so excited about the science that's being done. But I feel optimistic to be a researcher in this field because there's so many people who are so smart who are very committed to it. You know, I went to my first meeting in four years, three years, uh, two this year, actually. And the energy kept me manic for days that everybody was like, you know, we're so much closer. We're so, we're like... You know, it's just you awesome. can feel it. It's like palpable energy, and it's it's an interesting <laughs> thing. So I I'm, you know, keep moving forward, keep focusing, moving forward, and 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 I think we're going to be very close. You, know, you mentioned that struck me that um, you asked every patient what their belief system was and, and why they think you know they are where they are, and and it's fascinating to hear that from a scientific researcher because. Often that human element, you know, happens in conversations. But did you, you know, record those those answers? And has that ever been published? Uh, it's not published. I recorded it, and I took. I always take notes. Lorraine and I are kindred spirits, and that that I love that last picture is my favorite one that you showed because we always do that when she comes here. She pulls out from this big bag all these dog-eared articles with highlighting and pen. And I'm this. I still do that. I still highlight print everything, I like to read it in front of me and highlight it and take notes. And we share and we kind of, and it does this whole thing. So I have notes of of what they told me. And actually I made a slide of it. We're going to show it in the clinic on Friday. Really? Uh, yeah, which is, you know, some of the, some people, we, we had a few patients who basically, um, it's, it's very hard to say, but they had, they basically tried to end their life because of sadness over losing some, it's such survivor guilt. And it was interesting, this was a common theme that the lack of success in that 
was this realization that they had work to do and they think that that's what made them resile and be resilient and they think that's why their immune system is where it is and and i i thought that was such an interesting common theme to to hear and a lot of people who are just overflowing with altruism you know Lorraine alluded to this before um it's not for self ego it's for leaving the world a better place being a beacon of hope but really contributing there's some people who just have very investigative minds and they they come here because they want to understand but they also believe intrinsically there's something hardwired in them which isn't wrong you know that, that they have some predisposition a lot of them have family histories of relatives that never get you know one of the some of the things that non-progressors always tell me are i ha never get sick you know, and common cold sick, you know, they, I'm, I'm not going to get into the way the immune response responds to things like hepatitis and all that, but common colds will never sick and they have very rapid wound healing. And I always thought it's such a weird, interesting accompaniment. Like it's probably somehow interconnected. So a lot of these are anecdotes. You know, I have no science behind this, but you asked the question of, you know, what do you think and have you recorded? So I have taken all these types of notes that I always thought were fascinating that we still don't fully understand. But the, the, the common message is the one you're hearing, which is the zeal to move forward and to be present. And it's not, they're not motivated by money. I mean, we give that, we defray, we have inconvenience units that we pay for. People don't care. There was a point, Lorraine, you may remember this, but we were even, people were talking about donating their stipend to more research. You know, exactly. so it's really not that. So it's it's it's. I I know I'm all over the place, but I'm I'm the the mechanisms that people hypothesize were integrated into their belief system, which was integrated into their mission, and right. and all interrelated. I think. Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah, maybe yeah, someday when you if and when you retire, you can when you publish your memoirs, you can. Uh, Put yes. all together because that's a fascinating I just, piece. I just retired from the public health service, so and I <laughs> so, so we my, look for a book then. <laughs> yeah, so my mom said that she said, you know, you should describe your experience with Mark in the lab. And like, yeah, she's I right. Live it. I live it. We've been doing it, you know, it, it lives on. So, anyway. Listen to your mother, she's right. That's yeah. right. Listen to mommy. <laughs> So but, I mean, the reason I brought that up is because, I mean, those of us who've been working in this field, both living with HIV and, you know, promoting research have, have seen this time and time again. And a shout out to Corrine Dubay, who's on the call, because she's really she's a social scientist, um, very active in the cure space and, and has well documented this in a number of different uh, mm -hmm. contexts. And, and I think it's so important to know why people do what they do. And then, you know, as you were alluding, maybe this ties into you know, why they respond differently than others. There's that whole psychological component that, uh, you yes. know, gets undervalued and, uh, you know, is so important. You see it in, here in cancer all the time, right? If you have a positive attitude toward your, your diagnosis, you you do better than those who don't. So, uh, you know, I think it's fascinating. And we need to kind of keep that in, in mind as we do this work because uh, it's, it's a long slog, right, for, for many of us. Exactly. So um, I know some people had to leave at the top of the hour yeah. Uh, but we wanted to make this a conversation that went on when we have until um, uh, another 10 minutes or so. So if anybody on the call has questions they'd like to ask, please use your hand feature. I'll try to uh, see, you know, if you don't, to just raise your hand like that. But uh, we'd love to hear from from other people on the call who haven't had a chance. Oh, to, really? just ask time in. Can I just say goodbye to Loreen because I need to leave? You're an inspiration. And Steve, I'm telling you, I really enjoyed everything you had to say. The two of you together are a real team. That's <laughs> More of that. Thank you so much. And Thank you, Linda Hahn. Thank you, too, Jeff. <laughs> Thank you. Merry Christmas to you, honey. You. Our dynamic duo. Anyone else on the call have any questions? And I have one for you, Dr. Um, Miguelis. As you know, every once in a while, those of us who do this work, you know, I'll be at some presentation or something, and, and somebody from the audience will come up to me afterwards and say, you know, and I'll kind of whisper it. It's kind of interesting how they say it. I'm a, and I'm a long-term non-progressor. I've had it forever. You know, I have virtually, I have no virus or virtually no virus. I've never been on meds. I think the world needs to study this. You know, where do I go with this? So, you know, if there's something you could share with us and we'll, we'll share it in the, um, yeah. when we uh, post this recording, you know, whom do people call 
um, to join the cohorts, kind of what research is out there for people who uh, want to start participating in this. Sure. I mean, I think there are a lot of uh, a lot of opportunities. There's a lot of places that are continuing to, uh, you know, depending on where you live in the country, that are continuing mm -hmm. to bring patients in. Barbara Shacklet is a dear friend of mine in uh, Davis, near not too far from Lorraine, mm -hmm. who I know is enrolling patients. I, I believe Steve. I saw Steve Deeks for the first time in a long way where we were in the same room, uh, and also Ra Rachel Ruderhauser that works with him, who's wonderful. Um, and she and I were at a meeting together and I saw Steve at, at uh, a va the vaccine meeting earlier this year. I know, I'm pretty sure they're still uh, mm -hmm. bringing people yes. in. And our study is we're resuming, we, we've gotten the green light, received the green light recently okay. to um, bring people back and we, we're always enrolling more. Our, my, our mantra is we have a ceiling built into the protocol based on what the IRB has mandated, but we're ne we're, we won't end until we cure HIV and we find a, an answer. We figure out definitively how to apply what we've learned from controllers to, to that. So, so and the, the best way to read, just you can put my email in, I'll, I'll get it to, because um, I have a, we have a new, we have an acting study coordinator right now. That's usually the name and the email I would give. We also have a recruiter Rocky Calderero. So he's phenomenal and he gets the ball rolling. So I'll give you, um, what's the, do you want me to put it in the chat right now? I can put yeah, if you could, that'd be terrific. And then sure. uh, we'll send that afterwards with the uh, the call recording and make sure that. Sure. Okay. I'll put Thank both you. of ours in there and, and you can reach out to us and, and I'll, and I'll get you to the, to wherever Perfect. you want to come here. And then there's the, the, the Boston court. I don't know exactly where they are yeah. with mm -hmm. enrollment, but um, you know, <clears throat> They have a lot of resources and they're usually open to bringing people in so yeah um, excellent well, yeah. thank you for that that's a great yeah, question I think, yeah, go ahead. I, i'm so glad you asked it and by the way uh young lady up there nina martinez has her hand up. yeah go ahead nina thank you lorraine um, sure honey hey, Every, hey everyone, I'm Nina Martinez. I live in Atlanta. Um, I am the one that raised the issue at the re HIV oh. meeting that in the CARE oh. discourse, they were not talking <laughs> about people like Lorene. And I oh. was like, is it because we're women? <laughs> and, uh, and um, you know, Lorene's path is different than the, the CARE stories that we usually hear. But I know also as a 20 year clinical research participant at the NIH that we do give a lot of time, a lot of samples, a lot of data. Um, and you know, just because we're not the majority of participants that they end up getting, like our stories and voices don't get heard. So I'm yeah. super glad uh, to see Lorraine's face. I think uh -huh. 2006, they're the same year of, of I mean, my HIV diagnosis was very public, but 2006 was the year that I also started advocating at the Toronto International AIDS Conference. Um, so my question for uh, Dr. McGillis is, my first study at NIH was the Luca Parisa study in long-term non-progressors in 2003 at the age of 19 as a Georgetown sophomore. Uh, I'm a very big proponent of finding out what happens with my data, so you are free to contact me. I already dropped you an email before you shared it in the chat because I know how to reach anybody at HHS, and that's that's another secret talent of mine. Um, <laughs> but I think I think. One of the biggest, and Maureen, you can probably attest, one of the biggest motivators for participation retention is finding out what happens with that data. So I have a habit of every five to seven years after I enroll, searching for investigators' names in PubMed to see, you know, do they happen to have the one Hispanic woman who was age 19 in the cohort? And technically, I'm not supposed to be able to tell which one is me, but <laughs> I'm not I'm not old enough that I can't tell, but so that's good. <laughs> I'm still here. <laughs> can you can you just call me that's so awesome. I could I could look for because to be honest, I I know the names of the early patients and I don't remember analyzing data with your cells, but that doesn't mean that we didn't that it wasn't used. <laughs> oh, so. oh, you oh you did because um so I'm on the Luca Farisa blacklist now because that first visit when I when I Luca Farisa. Um, I ended up passing out with my first study, first adverse event. Oh, Sorry, IRB. But somebody came over from the NIAID lab to thank me for my donation. And I don't think, I think anybody else would have been scared off by a citrate reaction and passing no. out. Oh. But the fact that she came oh. over and thanked me for my donation, 
Ooh. That made an impression, and and that's so that how means, I ended that up means, saying that tells me though that you weren't on my study, so you might have been breezed as part of Susan Moyer's study, or there's some other investigators here. So I could figure, I could find that out though, because either way, no, it's it's the same one that Daniel Rogan is now listed on. It's the 20 year old. Yeah. Okay, well, I will I will search for you, uh, and and. <laughs> Um, it's 20 years ago, so like I, I get it that it doesn't <laughs> stick out, you know. I so I don't know if you could see, but in the corner, there's like a stack of things right there. Those yeah. are my lab books from 20 years ago. So, <laughs> so I will look in and see what I and I and I it might not have your name, but it will tell me what exactly was done, and I'll and I'll look and see if I can. I mean, oh, worst wow. comes to worst, I weigh 20 pounds more than I did back then, so maybe <laughs> I can be look for racist now. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, so, you, know, oh, I see, I, you just emailed me too. So I yep, will. Sure uh, did. Great. So <laughs> I will respond to that and we will. So awesome. I'll get an answer for you and we'll talk and I'll help you figure, you know, we'll figure something out. See, but this I, is icing on the cake, Jeff. Icing on the <laughs> cake that I get to meet the question asker. Nina, God bless you for your donations to the study at the NIH. You Thank know, you. God bless you. And these are the wonderful gifts that happen spontaneously, you know, I just delight in them because you can't make this stuff up, mm -hmm. right? You cannot make this stuff up. So bravo on your trail, right? Uh, keep, keep walking it, you know, it's really important. I myself have rolled off, you know, for the last couple of years, um, my activities, uh, I want to get back to my landscape design uh, talent. Um, I love plants. Uh, I, I booted up a virtual landscape design company during lockdown. And I just wanted to play with the plants again. You know, it's not that I don't care about our community, honey. But see, you inspire me with what you just shared with us. Thank you so much. It's good to know. It, it makes my heart. It warms my heart because I had a conflict in rolling off all the many groups and Zephyr. And it's hard because no one's replicated our group. And I know that uh, you're still out there, you know. So I, I care a great deal about you. And um, this is just precious what, what just happened with you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you both. And uh, I have to say... You know, you're both women. Um, all the elite control, or most of the elite controllers are women, aren't they, Dr. McGillis? Uh, so is there something in that, yeah. the stronger sex, uh, so to speak? Yeah, it was yes. great. When we started this, we kept saying that, oh, it's, you know, they're just all white men. Two-thirds of our cohort are not white men. So mm -hmm. really great. That's awesome. Terrific. Well, so, we're at the top of our, or the yeah. bottom of our hour, whatever it is, our half hour uh, yeah. at our time. But I just wanted to thank everyone again. Uh, Lorene, I mean, you're just such an inspiration. And thank you for your journey and sharing that with us, even though you're not as active as you once were. And, uh, you know, we all have lives to lead and other things to do. But uh, you planted a lot of seeds and seen them grow. And then we're immensely grateful. And to you, Dr. Miguelis, for all the work you've done over the course of your career and, and continue to do. So uh, best of luck in your new position. And uh, really, thank you both. You'll have to fill me in on that <laughs> in private. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today, and I wish everyone just the merriest of Christmases because we could all use it. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> yeah, thank you for whatever you all do. It means so much. Oh, for sure. They're just an awesome group of people. Thanks, sis. Thanks, thank you. Lisa, Oriel, Garin, yeah. Michael. Yeah. I love all of you. Yes. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs> yeah. Bye, everyone. Take care. Thank you, Jeff, honey. Love you, hon. Thank you.